All right, now this morning and next week, I'm going to test some material out on you that I plan to present at a lectureship somewhere down the road, and I'm particularly concerned about fitting the material into two classes, and teaching that to you will help me gauge that. So you're something of a guinea pig in this, but I hope it, I hope it won't be a bummer for you. Now in this first class, we got two classes, in this first class, I first want to paint briefly for you the background of Romans 14.1 to 15.13, and then I'll run through the text, summarizing how I understand what Paul is saying there. And that task may spill over into next week. I may not be able to get through 14.1 through 15.13, although I'm going to be moving quickly. But that task may spill over into next week, but the bulk of the class next week I'll share my thoughts on some application issues after we get straight what Paul is saying. I'll then talk about applying that in a way that I hope will be beneficial. But you're going to have to buckle up, okay, because I'm going to be moving quickly. So uh, all attention, because we're going to move. Now, the most, wide, the, mo the most likely scenario for the founding of the church in Rome is that Jews from Rome who were converted on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, you see in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, they brought their faith in Jesus with them back to their home synagogue. And that faith had then spread among the Jews there and also among some of the God-fearers who were Gentiles who were interested in Judaism and who attended the synagogue but didn't become Jews. Now by A.D. 57... When Paul wrote the letter Romans, the church in Rome was predominantly Gentile. And that change in ethnic composition was probably the result of Emperor Claudius's expulsion of the Jews from Rome in A.D. 49. And you can see that event, it's alluded to in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And then the Jewish Christians who had been expelled, the Jewish Christians who returned to Rome after Claudius' death in A.D. 54, they found themselves in a minority. Now, as you know, the Old Testament prohibited Israelites from eating certain kinds of meat and eating any meat that wasn't slaughtered in such a way as to drain the blood. And because of that, scrupulous Jews, they sometimes would avoid all meat when they were in an environment where they couldn't be sure the kind of meat it was or how it had been prepared or used beforehand. Even wine sometimes was avoided by Jews out of fear that it, it had been tainted with idolatry, that it had previously been used in some kind of idolatrous practice. But the conflict in Rome, it seems to be centered on food and holy days. That seems to be the real, uh, the center of the, of the conflict. Now those dietary rules and the observance of holy days, especially the Sabbath, those things were considered very important matters of Jewish faithfulness. Historically, they were, they were central to maintaining the unique and separate status of the Jewish people. Very important things to them. So when, when Jews became Christians, it was difficult for some of them to accept in their hearts that it was fine to eat things that they had from childhood been taught were offensive to God, and to accept that the prescribed holy days were no longer distinctively sacred. So when Jews became Christians, they struggled with these things. And this attachment to the Mosaic law, that attachment shows up in many places in the New Testament, as you know. Some Jews, they insisted that people had to submit to the Mosaic law and all its particulars to be saved in Christ. You see, for example, in Acts 15, verses 1 and 5, you see an illustration that these are, of course, the Judaizers. Those are the people whom Paul so fiercely opposed in Galatians and elsewhere. But others, like the Jewish Christians in Rome, they continued to practice certain Jewish customs or ritual aspects of Judaism, 
as a matter of personal conscience without making it a test of salvation. But even among that group, there was a tendency to hold at a distance those who weren't following the dietary rules and observing the holy, day, holy days. There was a tendency to view them as at some level less faithful or less devoted to God. And conversely, from the other side, there was a tendency among those who didn't follow the law to look down on the law keepers as unenlightened and arrogant. That's how most commentators understand the root issue in Romans 14.1 to 15.13. Here's how Colin Cruz puts it in his commentary. He cites three or four very well-known commentators as agreeing with him. But he says the most widely accepted view, and that adopted in this commentary, is that the weak are Jewish Christians, including possibly proselytes, Gentiles who'd converted, who practiced essentially Jewish customs, and the strong were mainly Gentile Christians, including some Jewish believers who were liberated like Paul himself, who felt no obligation to practice these customs. This sets the root issue, what's going on. And what Paul is doing in Romans 14, 1 to 15, 13, it's his plea for peace among those two groups. And what I want to do now, I'm going to run through the text, and I'm going to tell you how I understand what Paul is saying. I'm going to move quickly. The first section, verses 1 to 12, in Romans uh, chapter 14, the strong and the weak must receive one another. And Paul says in verse 1, but welcome the one who's weak in faith, remembering who that is, that's the Jewish Christians who are following these things. Welcome the one who's weak in faith, though not for quarrels about opinions. Paul tells the Gentile majority there in Rome that they're to welcome or to receive one who is weak in faith, meaning the Jewish Christian who's weak in his grasp of the implications of the faith, who has underdeveloped convictions about what the faith allows. Now, these weak Christians, they're not merely to be tolerated. They're not merely to be tolerated, but are to be accepted into the fellowship of God. They're not to be mocked or disparaged for their convictions as that would make them feel like outsiders. Moreover, they're to be accepted with the right motivation and the right spirit. They're not to be received provisionally for the purpose of quarreling with them over their misguided convictions. That doesn't mean that teaching them is forbidden. Okay? It doesn't mean that teaching them is forbidden. It means that they're not to be received with the ulterior motive of setting them straight. They're not to be given a kind of contingent or probationary reception. They are to be fully received. Then he says in verses 2 to 5, or 2 to 4, that should be, a, yeah, 2 to 4. He says, one person has the faith to eat everything, but the one who's weak eats only vegetables. Let the one who eats not despise the one who does not eat, and let the one who does not eat not judge the one who eats, for God welcomed him. Who are you to judge another's house slave? To his own Lord he stands or fall, and he, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. He says here in verses 2 to 4 that, that those whose faith is strong enough to eat meat, that they're not to have a disdainful or condescending attitude toward the law-observing Jewish minority but neither is the Jewish minority to judge those who eat meat, for God has welcomed them. You see, and since God accepts the meat eaters, then so must the Jewish Christians. After all, it's the Lord's judgment of his servant that matters, right? It's his judgment that matters, and the meat eater will stand in the Lord's approval as meat eating is not wrong for the Christian. So he tells, the, he tells the Jewish minority there, you can't be condemning these meat eaters because God accepts them. Then he says in 5 and 6, for one person judges one day in preference to another day, but another person judges every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. 
The one who esteems the day esteems it to the Lord. And the one who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And the one who abstains from eating, abstains to the Lord and gives thanks to God. As I indicated, the Jewish and Gentile Christians, they differed on this observance of holy days and in, in eating meat. And in verses 5 and 6, Paul notes that the, that the scrupulous Jew, he considered certain days, especially the Sabbath, as distinctively holy. Whereas the Gentile believer considered all days equal in holiness. And the scrupulous Jew also considered it wrong, or at least inferior, or less pious, to eat meat or to drink wine that may be ritually unclean, that may be ritually contaminated. And Paul says that either practice is acceptable. Either practice is acceptable as long as it's done with a clear conscience, as long as each one is fully convinced in his own mind that the conduct is acceptable to God. Now, it is crucial. It's crucial to note that the practices of both the strong and the weak in this matter are acceptable to God because neither is sinful. The one who observes holy days and abstains from eating meat and drinking wine because he erroneously but sincerely believes it's God's will to do so, that person is doing more than God requires by restricting his freedom. The one who correctly understands that food, that food laws and the sacred days of the Mosaic law are not binding on Christians, that person is enjoying his freedom in the Lord. It's like circumcision. It is not sinful to do it, neither is it sinful to abstain from doing it. You see, that's how this is in this meat eating and these observance of these days. It is morally neutral. So one restricts his freedom and does more than the Lord requires. The other enjoys his freedom in Christ. Now, when something is sinful, when something is contrary to the will of God, it doesn't become acceptable just because the one doing it mistakenly thinks it's not sinful. You see, ignorance doesn't baptize sin. That's not the situation that's being dealt with here. It's only when something is a matter of indifference to God that one's conscience becomes the controlling guide. In the case of morally neutral matters, if you think or you feel that it's wrong, then for you it is wrong. You see, in morally neutral matters, if you have some kind of guilt about it, you feel it's wrong, then for you it is wrong, although objectively it's morally neutral. That's an important idea. Of course, the scrupulous Jew believes at some level that it is a matter of God's will. That's why his conscience is bothering him when he's engaging in this. In this case, however, we know the scrupulous Jew's wrong. We know flat out the scrupulous Jew's wrong because Paul tells us he's wrong. He tells us that implicitly by the fact he labels the Jews weak in faith and he leaves the issue as a matter of conscience in verse 5, which he wouldn't do if it was objectively sinful to eat meat. And he also makes that point explicitly in verses 14 and verse 20. So here we know that the scrupulous Jew is wrong. The Jewish Christian, he hears these words. He hears these words in this teaching, but he has not yet internalized them. He hasn't internalized them so as to be free in his heart from the conditioning of his upbringing. You see, he doesn't yet have the consent of his conscience to engage in the practice. He hears it, but he is so far unable to internalize it because he's had it drummed in his head from childhood. 
So he just can't get over that. He feels there's something wrong about it. Now, Paul's indication that the observance of holy days is a matter of indifference to God, well, certainly here, that raises questions for us. I mean, that, that raises several issues. Is Paul denying that Sunday is the appointed day for Christians to gather for corporate worship? Is that what he's doing? I don't think so. After all, Sunday is called the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, which shows that it is somehow distinctive from other days. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we see Paul told both the Galatian churches and the Corinthians to set aside a sum of money for the collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem on the first day of the week. We see in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, in Acts 27, you see that the saints gathered together on the first day of the week specifically to take the Lord's Supper. They're referred to as to break bread. What Paul is saying is that under the new covenant, the Jewish practice of considering certain days as distinctively holy, as distinctively holy, that that's a matter of indifference to God. No day is holier than another to those who are in Christ. Rather, all days are equally holy. So Christians are not obligated to observe the Sabbath or to observe other Jewish holy days. And you can see that same truth indicated in Galatians 4, 9 and 10, Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17. So that means that those who seek to bind Sabbath observance on Christians are wrong. And if they make it a test of salvation, as the Judaizers did, well, they're the, then they're in serious trouble. That the Lord's Day is an appointed day for Christian worship does not mean it is a more sacred day, a distinctively holy day, in the sense that the Sabbath was a more sacred day. Now, I, I realize that some believe that the Lord's Day, that Sunday, is a Christianized version of the Jewish Sabbath. But I don't think that's right. Let me read to you a quote from Andrew Lincoln. From, he's a New Testament scholar. Andrew Lincoln, several decades ago, in his contribution to the book, From Sabbath to Lord's Day, he says, The Lord's Day need not be understood in terms of a sacred day. The day can be said to be the Lord's because it's the appropriate day for worshiping him. And this is significantly different from the view that sees the day by analogy with the Jewish Sabbath as a full 24-hour period belonging to the Lord in a distinct way from that in which all the Christian's time belongs to the Lord. Whereas the latter is in conflict with the sentiment approved in Romans 14.5, the former need by no means be. There is a sense in which all of life should be a prayer, and yet a recognition of this does not detract from the need for specific prayer at specific times. Similarly, the notion that all of one's time is devoted to the Lord does not detract from the necessity of specific worship at specific times. To claim that specifically Sunday is the appropriate day for a gathering of the Christian community for worship is not to imply that somehow in itself that day is holy. That's the distinction I think that Paul is after here. He's telling him that. So when he says these things, I know this raises these kinds of questions for us. So that's a brief detour, okay, about that. Now, is Paul saying that Christians are free to make up their own holy days and observe them because holy days are a matter of indifference to God? I don't think so. The holy days that Paul is talking about here in Romans had been prescribed by God under the Old Testament. It's one thing for the Jew who had been trained in the law all of his life to feel that observing those days was an honor to God. It's another thing to feel that days never appointed or sanctioned by God that we've simply made up that they can be observed in honor to him. See, we are not in the same position as those Jews whose consciences have been caught in this salvation historical shift that was brought about by Christ's coming. 
See, they happen to be right there when this comes. We're not in that same position. So those are little side notes that I know when the things that Paul says here bring to your mind. So I at least wanted to let you know, yes, I see those questions. And I'm, I just say a little bit about it. Verse 7, he says, for none of us lives for himself. Go back up here. You see here he's ta- what he's talking about. The one who abstains from eating, abstains to the Lord and gives thanks to God. 7 to 9, for none of us lives for himself and none dies for himself. For whether we live, we live for the Lord. Whether we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Pri- for, for to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might exercise lordship over both the dead and the living. Now here he says that the Christian must follow his conscience in such morally neutral matters. That's what he's been saying. You know, if your conscience is clear in this, and a Christian must do that, a Christian must follow his conscience in such morally neutral matters because he or she lives to please the Lord. Not fellow believers. We are the Lord's from start to finish. And every aspect of our lives, even our death, is under his lordship. Christ's lordship is so total that it includes both the dead and the living. So that's why we have to follow our conscience, because we are servants of the Lord. He says in 10 to 12, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you too, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, to me every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul says here in in 10 to 12, he explains that refusing to accept one another because of disputes over matters that are matters of indifference to God is absurd in light of the fact that we will each answer to God not only for our practices, but also for our refusal to receive one another. So here we are going to divide over matters that are matters of indifference to God. And he's pointing out here that that's absurd. That's something that's absurd. Now, this next section here in verses 13 to 23, he goes in and he tells them, do not cause your brother to stumble. And this really gets to some, uh, well, it's all meat, but this really gets to a focal point. He says, let us therefore, let us therefore no longer judge one another, but judge, decide this instead. Not to place a stumbling block for a brother or a pitfall. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself except to the one who considers something to be unclean. To that one, it is unclean. The one whose conscience isn't clear. So Paul is saying objectively, I know that nothing is unclean. None of this food is unclean except to the one who has these guilt feelings about it, he can't do that. For if your brother is grieved, you see, that's a parenthetical. Four, he's going to go up and connect back to the end of 13, where he says at the end, not to place a stumbling block for a brother or a pitfall, 15, 15, for if your brother is grieved on account of your food, you are no longer walking in accordance with love. Do not by your food destroy that one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be blasphemed. Verse 13, he tells the Jewish and the Gentile Christians that rather than judge each other, they ought to decide, they ought to judge not to place before their brother or sister a stumbling block, a spiritual trap, a cause of offense. In other words, we're not to do something that will lead to the spiritual downfall of our brother or sister. And it becomes clear in the following verses that Paul is speaking specifically about differences between Jewish and Gentile Christians regarding the old covenant food laws. That's what he's talking about. As I indicate here in this translation, verse 14 
is somewhat parenthetical and that it gives the basis on which one's behavior can be a stumbling block or an obstacle. The basis on which one's behavior can lead to another's spiritual harm. The fact of the matter is that no food is unclean. That's the fact. No food is unclean, meaning ritually defiled as defined in the Mosaic law. Those aspects of the law, the food laws, have no continuing validity. Indeed, the Lord himself taught that, right? As Mark chapter 7 verse 19 makes clear, he declared all foods clean. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. See, the Jewish Christians whom Paul labels weak in the faith, they haven't been able to fully internalize that truth. We saw the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 with the Gentile Christians uh, eating in the idol feast in the temple. They have not been able to fully internalize that. Their consciences have been so firmly trained in the Mosaic food laws that many of them, they cannot escape the sense That it's somehow wrong to eat meat or drink wine that may be ritually unclean. They hear you. They see your lips moving. But they can't internalize it and get away from the sense of gnawing guilt that there's something there. And because of that personal conviction, they would be sinning if they consume this kind of food or drink. If you believe... God forbids you to do something. If that's what you think, you're wrong, but you believe that God forbids you to do something. Doing it dishonors God. Because in that case, you're saying that you value that thing more than you value pleasing God. In fact, in verse 23, he says, the man who doubts stands condemned if he eats. That's why. So Paul is giving the rationale. How is it possible that someone's conduct may put somebody else in jeopardy? And he's letting you know that the way it works is, is that though it's objectively okay for the person who thinks it's not, if he is induced to engage in it, he will be sinning. And so that's an important thing. Verses 15 and 16, Paul explains the end of verse 13 decide not to place a stumbling block for your brother in light of what he said in verse 14, violating one's conscience is sinful. And he says says to the Gentile majority that certain ways of exercising their right to eat meat and drink wine may lead their Jewish brother or sister into sin by pressuring them to act contrary to to their albeit hyperactive conscience. You may push them to act ahead of their conscience, and when you push them to do that, you have pushed them to sin. So that's what he's telling the Gentile Christians there. That would be that would not be consistent with the cardinal Christian virtue of love. Because if you're treating your brother or sister that way, You're not loving them. He goes further at the second part of verse 15 and he commands them not to exercise their freedom to eat in such a way that it will destroy their weaker Jewish brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. They're not to let their good liberty be reviled. It is a good thing. It's freedom in Christ. But they're not to let their good liberty be reviled, be blasphemed, he says in verse 16, which is what would happen if they exercise that liberty without regard to the tender consciences of their Jewish brothers and sisters. Here's what Cranfield says in his commentary. The gar of verse 15, 4, connects the sentence not with 14, but with 13b, the weak in faith will be grievously hurt He will have the integrity of his faith, faith in its deepest sense of fides qua. 
and obedience destroyed and his salvation put at risk if he is led by his strong fellow Christian's insistence on exercising the liberty which he, the strong Christian, truly has into doing something for which he as yet does not possess the inward liberty. The strong will therefore not be acting in accordance with Christian love if his weak brother is thus seriously hurt on account of the food which he, the strong Christian, eats. Now this all seems pretty clear to me, in fact. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me, but that's what Paul is talking about and what he's putting out. Now he says, Paul says in 17 and 18, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For the one who in this serves Christ as a slave is pleasing to God and approved by people. Paul explains here that the kingdom of God in which we as Christians, the kingdom in which we participate, is not essentially a matter of eating and drinking, but a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy that are produced by the Holy Spirit. And here I think Paul's referring to moral living, to support of and harmony with fellow Christians, and to joy in the life and fellowship with which God has blessed us. Joy in that life and fellowship. The one who serves Christ with these priorities on straight, as Paul is urging them to do, that one is pleasing to God rather than being blasphemed, reviled by the weak. That person is esteemed by them. You see, he's esteemed by them and respected by the larger society for having a generous spirit and respecting the rights of those with whom one disagrees. So that's what he's talking about. He says, before, don't let, don't let your liberty be reviled or blasphemed. Here he says, for the one who serves Christ as the slaves is pleasing to God and approved by people. The weak for, to whom you defer are grateful and they thank you. And the larger society sees that as something that is gracious and an act of love. And they see that and they speak that way. So then he says in 19, so then, let us pursue the things of peace and the things of edification for one another. He exhorts them to pursue peace and mutual edification. That's what he's telling them to do. To build and to strengthen and to bless, not to trample. You see, Cranfield says, what is required is an altogether earnest seeking to promote among brethren such a true peace based on the fundamental peace with God, which God himself has established in Christ, as must manifest itself in mutual upbuilding. Now this applies to all of the Christians to whom Paul's writing, but the strong especially, the strong especially needed to hear it because of their insensitive treatment of the weak. They were trampling them, and they needed to hear this. And then Paul says in 20, he says, do not for the sake of food demolish the work of God. All things are indeed clean, but it is evil for the person who eats with stumbling to eat. It's clean, objectively clean. So there is liberty there, but for the person who hasn't internalized that, for him to eat, it is evil. He is sinning. He says it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or anything or anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, strong one, keep to yourself before God. Now Paul says here, he rephrases the same points that he made in verses 13 to 15. The believer shouldn't eat meat, drink wine. Or do anything else when to do so will harm his brother or sister by pushing them to act ahead of their conscience. The strong shouldn't exercise their convictions in their weak brother's faces. You see, thereby placing a stumbling block in their path, 
but they should abstain in those situations. They should forego the liberty that is properly theirs in the situation where not foregoing it will harm a brother or sister. That is what love requires. And that is what Paul is telling him. That's what it means in verse 22 to keep the convictions, the faith you have to yourself before God. And see, Paul says, Paul clearly states, he clearly states that all food is clean. He obviously is not forbidding all teaching of the weak. Right? I mean, he's teaching them. That's not what he's forbidding. He is, however, restricting the strong's exercise of liberty until the weak among them have genuinely been enlightened. So in the presence of the weak, those whose conscience is not clear to engage in the activity, you cannot do it in their faces because you will propel them to act ahead of their weak conscience and when they do that, they sin. That's what Paul is saying to them. That when, when, you, when they do that, they sin. Then he says, 22, second part to 23, blessed is the man who does not bring judgment on himself by what he approves. But the man who doubts stands condemned if he eats because it is not from faith and everything that is not from faith is sin. He says, blessed is the strong believer whose conscience doesn't condemn him when he exercises his liberty. That's a blessing. Because you have the right convictions and conscience, you're not bothered when you exercise your liberty that you truly have. So he says that is a blessing. But the weak believer who eats with doubts about the propriety of eating, that person is sinning and is therefore under God's condemnation. As there is the anonymous author, a fourth century commentator on the book of Romans, it's, he's anonymous, but uh, Erasmus during the Reformation dubbed this commentator Ambrosiaster. And he says in this fourth century commentary, it is true that if someone thinks it is wrong to eat, but does so anyway, he is condemned. For he makes himself guilty when he does what he thinks he ought not to do. If someone acts against his better judgment in a matter of conscience, then Paul says it is a sin. And I think that's right. That's what Paul is saying. 15, 1 to 6, we now get the example of Christ. He says, now we the strong ought to bear the weaknesses. Now listen to this. This is a message, see, I want to teach this. Because this is a message that I think our society and culture finds just terribly offensive. The idea that the strong should withhold their liberty to bless the weak. Particularly when the weak is a minority and in the wrong. We just, we don't like it. But he says here, now we the strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are not strong. And not to please ourselves, let each of us please his neighbor in what is good for the purpose of edification. For even the Christ did not please himself. But just as it is written, the insults of those who insult you fell on me. See, rather than the strong pleasing themselves by insisting on the unfettered exercise of their liberty, they ought to bear the weaknesses of the, weaknesses of the weak, meaning they ought to ease the burden of the weak by accepting them and doing what love requires toward them. You see, this is a, that's how you bear with the weaknesses. You bear the weaknesses of those who are not strong. Each of the strong should please his weak neighbor, the fellow Christian, for the neighbor's spiritual benefit, which results in what? Edification. It results in growth, upbuilding, solidarity. That's what flows from that in the community of faith. For even Christ didn't please himself. Now what an indictment. He says even Christ didn't please himself, but he went to the cross where he bore for others. He bore for others the, the ultimate insults against God. Here's what Cranfield says. 
All right, I heard that bell. Cranfield says about this, the purpose of the quotation of Psalm 69.9 is to indicate the lengths to which Christ went in his not pleasing himself. If he, for men's sakes, was willing to bear as one element of his sufferings the concentration of all men's hatred of God, of all their futile, inanely contemptuous insolence, insolence against God, how absurdly ungrateful should we be if we could not bring ourselves to renounce our self-gratification in so unimportant a matter as the exercising of our freedom with regard to what we eat or whether we observe special days. For the sake of our brothers for whom he suffered so much. Right? Isn't that what Paul's saying? He's telling this would be insane. You see what Jesus bore for us. What he wound up, what he, he, what he took and endured for us. And in verse 4 he says, For as much as was written beforehand was written for our instruction, in order that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might hold hope securely. So having quoted Psalm 69.9, Paul here in verse 4, he reminds them that the Scriptures were written, why? For their instruction. They were written for their instruction so that with endurance and by means of the encouragement provided by the scriptures, they might remain steadfast in their hope. And though written in the past, it was God's word for them. It is God's word for us. And so Paul, he tells them that. And then in verses 5 and 6, he says, And may the God of endurance and encouragement give you a like mind among yourselves in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that unanimously and with one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. These verses contain a prayer of intercession that Paul offers to God and he records for the benefit of the Roman Christians. It serves as an indirect way of exhorting them. See, when Paul says, this is, this is my prayer, he's exhorting them. His prayer is that they may have a like mind among themselves. Meaning that despite their differences over food laws and holy days, they might remain united in their devotion to the Lord and serving him in the world. See, only when that kind of unity exists, only when that kind of unity exists are we able to glorify God in the way he deserves to be glorified. That is a foundational aspect of our glorifying God as a united people rescued. And so Paul is very concerned about this. Division over matters of indifference, it diverts the church from its purpose of glorifying God. And so this is why Paul is spending so much. I've got the last section. I didn't think I'd get this far, so this is all gravy. I'll talk till the bell rings. Okay. It says, therefore, welcome one another, just as also Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. He urges, he urges the saints to accept one another as fellow members of of the family because they've been received by Christ and therefore are. They are fellow members of the family, the family of God. And this kind of acceptance and this kind of unity, this redounds to the glory of God. Then he says in, in 8 to 12, For I say, Christ has become a servant of the circumcision for the sake of God's truth in order to confirm the promises to the fathers the patriarchs, and the Gentiles glorify God for his mercy, just as it is written. On account of this, I will acknowledge you among the Gentiles and sing praise to your name. And again, it says, rejoice Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all the Gentiles and not all the people's praise. And again, Isaiah says, he will be the shoot of Jesse, the one who arises to rule the Gentiles. On him, the Gentiles will hope. You see, what Paul is doing here, he says here that, that, they all sort of receive each other because Christ has acted to bring God's blessings to both Jews and Gentiles in fulfillment of the scriptures. He says in verse 8 and 9 that Christ became a servant of the Jew. Remember, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He became a servant of the Jew in order to show that God is faithful. Faithful. 
Let me finish this. Just hold on a second. In order to show that God is faithful by fulfilling the promise of, of the blessings that he made to the Jewish patriarchs, right? He promised them blessing. So here he comes to the Jew. He's faithful. He fulfills those promises. And he also became a servant of the Jew in order that what? The Gentile might glorify God for the sake of his mercy through their subsequently being what? Grafted into Israel. So he comes faithful to his promise to the patriarchs and the Gentiles glorify him for that because in that the Gentiles then, as Paul says in Romans 11, the Gentiles are then grafted into the people of Israel. You see, so he's telling them here. He's saying, listen, this is, this is the thing. This is important because this is in keeping with the scriptures, you see. In 9 and 12, he quotes various scriptures to show the inclusion of Gentiles with Jews in the praise of God that has always been part of God's purpose. Okay, I'm over time. Thanks for hanging in. Next week, Lord willing. All right, we're carrying on. Now, this is the second of two classes on Romans 14, verse 1 through 15, 13. I'm scheduled to present this material uh, next month at the, at the Harding University Bible Lectureship. And since I had two classes before our beginning of the study of Job, I wanted to present it to you. Now, last week, I explained that Romans 14, 1 through 15, 13... It's an appeal for peace between the Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. Some of the Jewish Christians, they were not yet able to accept in their hearts that it was fine to eat things that they had from childhood been taught were offensive to God, nor could they accept that holy days prescribed in the Mosaic Law that they were no longer distinctively sacred or holy. Of course, the Gentile Christians, they had no qualms about eating meat, and they felt no compulsion to observe the Jewish holy days. And there was a tendency, a tendency among the Jewish minority to hold at a distance those who weren't following the dietary rules and observing the holy days to view them as at some level less faithful or less pious, less devoted to God. And conversely, there was a tendency on the part of the Gentile majority to look down on these law keepers as unenlightened and arrogant. And again, 14, 1 to 15, 13, it's a plea for peace among those two groups. Now, last week I ran through the text, 14, 1 through 15, 13, I ran through that text and explained to you what I think Paul is saying there. This morning I want to share some thoughts on application of Paul's teaching. So it depends on and builds on what I said last week. So if you want to hear from that, uh, I don't know what to say. But in Romans 14, 1 to 15, 13, Paul there makes clear that it's God's will for a Christian to abstain from optional conduct when engaging in that conduct may encourage a Christian who's not convinced the conduct is acceptable to God to engage in it contrary to his conscience. It would be unloving to exercise one's liberty in such a brother's presence because that would put undue pressure on that brother to act ahead of his conscience to engage in the conduct before he was convinced internally that he, it was acceptable to do that, which would be a sin for him. And pushing a brother to sin by violating his conscience is a grave wrong, not only because it's deeply distressing, it's, what, it's the cause of the brother's grieving, as you see in 1415, but it can, it can begin a hardening process that leads to spiritual ruin. It can destroy the brother. That's why Paul generalizes the principle. In 1421, he generalizes it. Love will neither grieve nor endanger another for the sake of personal preference. He says as much in Romans 
Now, Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 13. This thing going to work, yeah. He says the same thing in relation to the, the consciences of certain Gentile Christians. He says there that even if the arguments that some in the Corinthian congregation were making, that it was acceptable to eat cultic meals in pagan temples, even if those arguments were correct, which he explains in chapter 10, verses 14 to 22, they were not correct. But he says in chapter 8, even if those arguments were correct, the principle of brotherly love still would require them to forego the practice so as not to push their brothers who were former idolaters into violating their weak consciences. Weak here meaning their idol-sensitive consciences by participating in the meal. So you see in Romans he's dealing with the weak being Jewish Christians with their dietary rules. In Corinth he was dealing with the weak being Gentile Christians in terms of participating in idol feasts. Now, a complicating factor in applying Paul's teaching today is that we don't have an apostle or an inspired interpreter to answer definitively whether the matters of personal conduct over which we disagree and we dispute, whether they are in fact matters of indifference to God. You see, whereas Paul, speaking by the Spirit, he, he specified, that consuming ritually contaminated meat and wine was a morally neutral matter. We continue to disagree over whether certain conduct, whether it's dancing or playing cards or consuming alcohol in any amount and many other things, we continue to disagree whether that's prohibited. So there's this complicating factor there. But the good news is that this complicating factor this lack of certainty about the sinfulness of certain conduct, it doesn't affect the duty that the strong owe the weak regarding that conduct. The position of the strong on these various matters we're talking about, the position of the strong, those with wider consciences, is that the conduct is indeed a matter of indifference to God. Otherwise, they wouldn't be engaging in it. You see, so they agree it's a Romans 14, 15 situation. So in terms of the strong, one simply needs to apply to them what Paul taught the strong in our text, in Romans 14, 1 to 15, 13. So I first want to look at applying Paul's teaching about the strong's duty toward the weak. And then at the end, I'll say a word about what an unresolved dispute regarding sinfulness of certain conduct, what that means for the weak's duty to accept the strong. Okay, you with me how I'm going about it? Now, in a culture that glorifies freedom and majority rule, Paul's teaching on the strong's obligation to the weak meets much resistance. Those with wider consciences cannot bear restricting their freedom for the sake of those they believe are in error, especially when those thought to be in error are a minority. There's this misguided notion that liberty is negated by any condition on its exercise and that the practices of, of a majority should not be circumscribed by a minority. And unfortunately, that notion sometimes trumps the injunction to love, and Paul's admonitions get rationalized away in the process. We fear the truth that we are to restrict our liberty out of love for Christians with narrower consciences because we fear it will lead inevitably to a church that's captive in everything, to the narrowest conscience in the group. Now, even if that were the case, which I'm convinced it's not, it's no justification for avoiding what Paul taught. Paul delivered the word of God not only to the Romans and the Corinthians, 
but also to us. Now, I don't have all the answers, and I know that shocks you. I don't have all the answers, but in applying Paul's teaching, I think it helps to keep a number of limitations in mind. First, Paul is speaking about matters of conscience, not matters of preference. For his teaching to apply, the conduct in question has to be something other than, it has to be something the other person feels at some level is wrong for him to do. It doesn't apply to disagreements over matters of preference, no matter how strong those preferences may be. One may prefer topical preaching over expository preaching, discussion Bible classes over lecture classes, taking the Lord's Supper before the sermon rather than taking it after, one kind of worship song over another kind of worship song. One may have good re and there are all kinds of preferences like that. And one may have good reasons for one's preferences, but however good those reasons are, those situations are outside the scope of Paul's teaching. He is dealing with what is believed, at least at some level, to be wrong. Something that violates one's conscience to engage in. So that's the first limitation that I think will be helpful. Second, Paul is speak, speaking about conduct, not teaching. He's speaking about conduct that's done in the presence of the brother or sister with the narrower conscience. That's why in Romans 14, 22a, he tells those with a broader conscience to keep the convictions they have to themselves before God and why in 1 Corinthians 8.10, he speaks of the one who sees you eating in the temple. You see, they are free. Christians are free to enjoy their, the liberty they have in Christ when they are away from brothers and sisters with a narrower conscience. Indeed, Paul in 14.22b, he labels blessed, blessed those who are able to enjoy their liberty with a clear conscience. Now, the restriction is limited to conduct done in, another person, in, in the other person's presence. It's restricted that way, presumably because doing something in someone's presence increases the pressure on that person to engage in that conduct before he or she is truly ready to do so. It's a different social and psychological dynamic. That's the key, I think. Paul was quite willing, he was quite willing to teach Jewish Christians that they were wrong in thinking they needed to abstain from meat and wine, which would influence them toward consuming it, right? Because Paul's teaching them that they're wrong in that conviction. He was quite willing to do that, but he forbid eating and drinking in their faces. So if, for example, one's brother can't play cards with a clear conscience, you may think that's stupid. But let's say he can't play cards with a clear conscience. One is free to tell him he's wrong. And one is free to play cards outside of his presence. But one cannot properly invite him to your house and play cards in his face. That's what Paul is talking about. So that is a restriction that I think will help us. A limitation on what Paul is saying. And third, Paul is speaking here and in 1 Corinthians. He's speaking of personal conduct, something that the brother with a narrower conscience can be induced to imitate, like eating meat or drinking wine or participating in temple feasts. Now, some things are thought by some to be wrong only for a church, only for a local community of believers to do. A person may believe, for example, that it's sinful for a congregation to incorporate or to have a kitchen. He has no problem with individual Christians incorporating or having Christians. He just thinks it's wrong for the church, the corporate entity, to do so. Now, I see those situations 
as being outside the scope of Paul's teaching in Romans 14 and 15 and in 1 Corinthians 8 because an individual cannot act as a community, cannot act as a congregation, and thus the Christian with a narrower conscience can't be induced to imitate the behavior he thinks is wrong so as to violate his conscience. Let me give you an example. Maybe I hope we'll get the concept across. It's like somebody who believes it's wrong from the perspective of the United States Constitution. It's like somebody who believes it's wrong, constitutionally speaking, for a public school to endorse a religion. But it's not wrong for individuals to do so. If his public school endorsed Christianity, he would think the school had done wrong. But he wouldn't thereby be induced to imitate that behavior he thinks is wrong because he cannot act as a public school. He can only act as an individual. So I think that is a limitation on what Paul is saying that we often don't appreciate. And it's part of what is part of our fear that keeps us from taking what Paul said seriously. The fourth thing to keep in mind is that Paul is speaking of optional conduct, the the foregoing of which doesn't leave one with only a substantially more burdensome way of obeying a divine command. And I would put the dispute over one cup and multiple communion cups in this category. See, unlike abstaining from meat and wine or abstaining from pagan temple feast in Corinth, unlike that, abstaining from those for the sake of a brother's narrower conscience, abstaining from multiple cups, that leaves one with only the one cup option for obeying the command to participate in the Lord's Supper, which for many people is a significant hindrance to taking the supper or to doing so with the required mindset. Some people simply cannot overcome their sense of disgust and their concern over disease from drinking after scores or hundreds of people. Now, granted, their gut-level aversion to doing so, it's not a matter of conscience. They don't believe it's sinful to use one cup, but it nevertheless is a reality that significantly hinders their obedience. Now, since Paul's directive in Romans to abstain from meat and wine and from temple feasts in Corinth carried no such spiritual cost, did not leave the abstainer with only a substantially more burdensome way of obeying a command. The one cup dispute seems to me to be outside the scope of Paul's teaching. So the proponent of using one cup can't rightly claim that Paul's teaching mandates that the elders shift to one cup for the sake of his conscience. That's that's not a proper use of what Paul is saying. The burden that that practice places on others' obedience is a distinguishing factor of which the elders must take account. So those are things that I think are significant, uh, that I think will help us as we try to apply Paul's teaching. You think, well, all right, well, has Paul's instruction died a death of a thousand qualifications? You see, has it, has it died that death? Is there nothing left that applies today? Well, his teaching regarding the strong's duty to the weak, it applies to a host of disagreements. Playing cards, drinking alcohol, dancing, celebrating holidays, on and on. It applies to a host of disagreements. But the one that's perhaps most pressing today is the case of instrumental music in worship, although clapping during the singing of songs in worship may be a close second. But the one that I think is most relevant today is the case of instrumental music and worship. Many people, this should should not surprise you, in the Church of Christ, many people are convinced it's sinful to worship God with instrumental accompaniment. And yet we see elderships in our brotherhood 
not here, but we see elderships in our brotherhood switching their congregations to instrumental worship. These leaders, they insist on engaging in the purely optional conduct of worshiping God with instruments in a community of saints that includes some who deny or are not fully satisfied that doing so is acceptable to God. Now these Christians certainly are being pressured to worship God contrary to their consciences through conduct that is done in their faces. Which Paul says, quite clearly in my judgment, that love will not do. But it's worse than that. They are having their consciences actually violated because corporate worship is a communal activity. It's something offered to God as a whole by a united body of believers. You see, it's not the separate offerings of individuals who happen to be in proximity to one another. It is our worship. It is a communal offering. If half the congregation burns incense or blows whistles, those not engaging in that specific conduct, they, are, they share in it in a way that they would not if that conduct was done personally or privately. So if you're doing that in your house, it doesn't influence me, and it doesn't implicate me the way it is if you want to burn incense when we as a community are worshiping God. There is a corporate aspect to this. That's why worship is always such a sensitive issue. Howard Norton, some decades ago, wrote in the Christian Chronicle, the public worship assembly is critical to our unity as a brotherhood. It always has been. Because of this, we must be exceedingly careful when we tamper with it in any way. We are very resilient in churches of Christ when the issues on which we disagree fall outside the public assembly of the saints. When controversial practices enter the public assembly, however, everyone is affected. And the possibility for division and shattering is scary. Now, I've heard the argument that Romans 14, 1 to 15, 13 has no applicability to instrumental worship because the words stumbling block and pitfall in Romans 14, 13 refer only to that which costs someone his salvation. And the disagreement over instrumental worship doesn't fall in that category, so one is told, because it doesn't involve one's trust in Christ. Well, that claim is mistaken. Okay, leaving aside the fact that stumbling block and pitfall can have a more general meaning, if that which may lead one to violate one's conscience regarding food laws constitutes a stumbling block and a pitfall, as it certainly does, then certainly that which may lead one to violate one's conscience regarding worship practices also qualifies. You see, the spiritual danger that Paul identifies lies in defiling one's conscience. That's the danger. That's the sin that's condemned by God in 1423. And that's the cause of the brother's grieving and destruction. It's not defiling one's conscience only with regard to food. It's defiling one's conscience. It is being pushed to do what one doesn't have the inner conviction, I can do it. And we don't think about that a lot. We don't think that matters. Now, one technique that's used to justify riding roughshod over the, over the more restrictive consciences of brothers and sisters in the matter of instrumental worship is to pit the duty not to harm them against the duty to evangelize. You see, it's first asserted that love for the lost requires Christians to change any optional behavior in order to maximize the attractiveness of the gospel. 
oftentimes citing, uh, citing 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. Well, instrumentalists, they then leap, to the, they leap from that assertion to the claim that the principle of abstention that Paul lays out in Romans 14, 1 to 15, 13, doesn't apply in cases where the narrow conscience of the weak is thought to be limiting the attractiveness of the gospel. In other words, if instrumental music is thought to make the worship assembly more appealing to the lost, then it's deemed acceptable to introduce it, regardless of whether it defiles the consciences of brothers and sisters. Now that strikes me as misguided for a number of reasons. The first of which is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul made clear, as I explained, that look, even if, even if those in Corinth were correct, that attending the temple feast was a morally neutral matter, which as I say in 10, he shows that's not the case. But in 8, he's saying, look, even if that were the case, love for weaker brothers still would require them to forego the practice. Right? That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 8. It didn't matter. It did not matter that the temple feast would have been an ideal place for making and building ties with non-Christians in the community for purposes of evangelism. That potential outreach benefit, its evangelistic utility, did not trump the obligation of love for weaker brothers and sisters. Second, why I think this idea that evangelism justifies doing this Few things are more devastating to the church's witness than dissension and a lack of love for its own. Few things hurt the church more than that. The maligning of the name of Christ, which results from failing to respect the tender consciences of brothers and sisters, more than offsets the attraction of any superficial lure. Paul says as much. In Romans 14, 18, he says, For the one who in this serves Christ as a slave, the one who in abstaining for the benefit of his brother or sister with a narrow conscience, is approved by people. People recognize the value of that in terms of the love that it reflects and expresses. Paul says as much there. Grant Osborne, in his commentary on Romans, he says, Above all, Believers must live on the basis of love by respecting the honest convictions of other Christians and honoring those convictions when in the presence of such weak brothers and sisters in Christ. This certainly has been proven true in our day as well. Many non-Christians say, why should I be a Christian? You don't get along with each other. So why should I think becoming a Christian will bring peace or happiness? And I think there's something to that. And third, the third is that edification or upbuilding of the saints, it's a crucial concern of the worship assembly. Edifying and building up the saints is a crucial concern of the worship assembly. Everything in that assembly is to be done with their upbuilding in mind. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. We worship God. But we do so in a way that is designed to build and encourage others. You see, so that's important. Everything is to be done with their upbuilding in mind. And there's no way I can see to square that concern with building and edifying brothers and sisters with defiling the consciences of brothers and sisters. You see, that's the opposite of building them up. That's tearing them down. And you see here, what does Paul say in 14, 19 and 15 too? It is abstaining that builds, that edifies. Trampling their consciences is the opposite of that. You are crushing them. It's tearing them down. Now Paul's statements in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, suggest nothing to the contrary. Nothing to the contrary. He there was speaking of using or foregoing 
his freedom from Jewish food laws so as not needlessly to alienate Gentile or Jewish non-Christians respectively. He certainly was not suggesting that a Christian should, out of concern over not alienating non-Christians, conduct himself in a worship assembly in a way that defiles another believer's conscience. Any alienation of non-Christians that results from honoring the conscience of one's brothers and sisters certainly is not needless. Now, isn't it clear what Paul would say to a Gentile Christian in Rome who insisted on eating meat at a church fellowship meal because doing so would attract non-Christians? I mean, I, we went through it last week. Now, is it as clear to you as it is to me what Paul would say in that situation? Paul would say there's no way you do that. I mean, after all, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 13, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat forevermore. It's not that important to me. I will not insist on doing it if it's going to damage you, perhaps destroy you. This idea, just get over it. That's not Christian. That's just not a Christian spirit. Just lump it. That's not, how, that's not how we should be going about it. Now, some think they can outflank the problem by splitting congregational worship into instrumental and non-instrumental services. Okay, but valuing an admittedly optional practice over the church's unity in worship Forcing a divide in that fundamental aspect of the church's being for the sake of a personal preference is to misjudge the extent to which God's pleasure in our praise is tied to the peace and unity of the spirit, to the one voice with which that praise is offered. I mean, what human father would be pleased if some of his children insisted on holding his birthday party in their preferred garden spot, knowing that his other children couldn't attend because of allergies. What human father would be pleased with that? The intended expression of love for the father would be ruined by the division and lack of brotherly love it reflected. It would be the antithesis of Psalm 133. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Moreover, splitting the congregation's worship by insisting on the optional practice, on, on an optional practice that excludes others, that broadcasts to the very community they want to reach how little they love and value each other. As I already indicated, that devastates a church's witness. I mean, church splits are a black eye. And I'd say all the more so when they are forced over matters of personal preferences rather than convictions of conscience. Just, I don't care enough about the unity and peace of the group that for my preference I'm willing to kiss you off. I think that's serious. And then thirdly, I submit that splitting the church this way, it's contrary to the edification and upbuilding that is central to the worship assembly. The division and lack of love that produced the separation, that division and lack of love would haunt each assembly and be a constant source of discouragement. Each segregated gathering would proclaim that personal preference is more important than Christ's desire for love and unity, and thus would be a tacit repudiation of the truth that Jesus is Lord. I mean, think about it. 
if maintaining socioeconomic divisions within an assembly caused Paul to declare that the Corinthians gatherings did more harm than good, maintaining those divisions within an assembly. He says that their meetings do more harm than good in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Would he not say the same about assemblies that are split for the sake of one group's musical preference? I think he would. Now, before concluding on the strong's duty to the weak, and I'll say something about the weak's duty to accept the strong in light of this uncertainty about uh, whether certain things are wrong. Before concluding on that, I should mention uh, what I see as a more general, kind of went strange, but okay, a more general qualification of Paul's teaching. Okay, I think there's a difference in what love owes a congregational member whose conscience is put at risk by a change in practice, there's a difference between what it owes that person and what it owes a person who joins a congregation knowing that the existing practices are unacceptable to his conscience. In the former case, the conscience pressuring or conscience violating practice is imposed on the member by the change. In the latter case, the person voluntarily exposes himself to what he considers unacceptable and unacceptable practice for the purpose of changing it. Voluntarily exposes himself to it so as to set those people straight. Okay? So one who, for example, joins an instrumental congregation believing it's wrong to use instruments in Christian worship, that person's in a different position, in my judgment, from one who is a member of an a cappella congregation that goes instrumental. Okay, so that's one thing we have here, a change in practice. I think there's a, there's a difference there. And second, I also want to add a footnote about Paul's use of the term weak in Romans 14. This is a thing that, that I, I think there's some confusion about. Those who believe it's wrong to worship God with instrumental music, those, just as an example, you can put everything in the, in the category, but to use them, those who think it's wrong to worship God with instrumental music, for example, they are similar to the weak ones in Rome in that the consciences of both are relatively restrictive. You see, that's why both need those with broader consciences to limit their liberty. They are dissimilar, however, in that only the weak ones in Rome were for certain misguided. You see, only the weak ones in Rome were certainly misguided. You see, there's a long-standing and unresolved dispute about the propriety of instrumental music and worship. So to the extent that the label weak ones, when you apply that, to the extent that label connotes that one's view is erroneous, in addition to being relatively narrow, I think applying it to those who are opposed to instrumental music is misleading, and in my judgment, it's needlessly alienating. But as long as you see the concept, that's what I'm trying to get across. All right, now, what about the, the weak's duty to the, to the strong, to accept the strong, in light of this uncertainty that we have about whether certain things are, in fact, sinful? We have disputes about these things. How are those with a narrower conscience to relate to those with a wider conscience when they disagree whether the conduct in question is morally neutral. You see, unlike the matter of ritually contaminated meat and wine, unlike that matter that Paul established definitively was morally neutral, in these cases, what I'm talking about, those with the narrower conscience they're convinced that those with the wider conscience simply are sinning. You see, I, I, they're saying, hey, here, narrower conscience, 
Wider conscience, you're simply, you're simply doing wrong. We don't have a situation where we have Paul saying definitively that it isn't something a morally neutral matter. You see, the, 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 here in this case, the narrow ones think you're just living in disobedience to the Lord and we don't have an authoritative arbiter to settle the dispute. I keep saying something, you keep saying something, neither of us convinces the other. So what, what is the weak to do? The one with the narrower conscience who believes this conduct is sinful. The one with the broader conscience who believes it's not. What is a person to do in this context where we don't have an authoritative arbiter to say, that's right, that's right? Well, how are they to treat one another? Well, there, I hate to tell you, there's no easy answer to this. There's no easy answer to it, okay? But I'm convinced that a person must steer. Let me see if this will come up. Yes. A person must steer between the twin dangers of arrogance and relativism. That is, one has to maintain some degree of humility regarding one's own understanding of God's will, recognizing that you are a sinful, fallen, fallible interpreter. You see, you have to have a true appreciation. There has to be some degree of humility in your understanding of God's will. But at the same time, one cannot drain Scripture of all objective meaning such that all interpretations are deemed legitimate or valid. See, not everything is ambiguous and up for grabs. The fact it's possible to twist the Scriptures, as Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, means there are interpretive boundaries that can't be transgressed. So if, for example, the Galatian Christians, if they embrace the Judaizers' heresy, it would, would be of no help to them that they had been deceived into doing so. You see, there are interpretive boundaries that cannot be transgressed. Well, the question, it seems to me, well, then how, what do you do? And all I can do is offer these guidelines. And the question, it seems to me, is not whether one is convinced subjectively that the conduct in question is condemned by God, but whether one is convinced in light of standard interpretive methodology and the history of interpretation that a reasonable or good faith handling of the word requires that conclusion. You see, in other words, it's not simply am I convinced. It is am I also convinced that a, that a good faith, reasonable handling of the word based on standard interpretive methodology in the history of interpretation requires that conclusion. And the more strongly one believes that's the case, the more one is obligated to consider the conduct as beyond the Christian pale. So it's simply a scale as I slide, and the more I feel that that's unreasonable beyond the pale, the more I have to treat it that way. You see, it's one thing, just as an example, to make room in the body of Christ for disagreements over the sinfulness of things like social drinking and dancing. It's another thing altogether to do so regarding something like homosexual conduct. You see, these disputes are different in kind. And so that's, that's all I can say, really, is when you have these things that one person is here saying, I'm convinced that drinking any alcohol at all, as an example, is sinful. Other person says, I think that's a misunderstanding. Drunkenness is the thing. Okay, so now a person who's here in the, in the narrower conscience needs to wrestle with this and say, is that view unreasonable or something that a person in good faith cannot reach? And if they say, no, I, I think I can see how somebody can get that, and I see that historically that's the way that goes, okay, we just live in our disagreement. But there are other things that are heresy that the church must say that's beyond.
Okay, now exactly where that is, that's, uh, you know, your hair will turn gray and may even fall out. You see? All right, I'm through. Timing's pretty good. Thank you for letting me uh, run this material by you.